Southern Africa, 1879. Thousands of warriors from the Zulu tribe descend upon a camp defended by an imperial army of both British and native troops. Armed with modern weapons and superior firepower, the British expected to hold off the attack. But as we'll see today, modern weaponry may not be enough to defeat this cunning and highly maneuverable adversary. For many years, the British Empire had been expanding its power in the region, with the ultimate goal of dominating vast swaths of land rich with diamonds and other resources. To do this, the British had to subjugate the local tribes and settlers into falling in line with their efforts. Thus far, the British had been somewhat successful in subduing the local tribes, but their efforts paused when diplomats attempted to coerce the Kingdom of Zululand into falling in line with their efforts. In 1878, the British sent an ultimatum to the tribal leadership of Zululand, demanding that the Zulu nation completely disband their army, government, and society as a whole. For obvious reasons, the ultimatum was completely disregarded, and the British took it upon themselves to march into their territory and compel them with force. The Cape Colony authorities ordered Lord Chelmsford, the commander of the British forces in the area, to march his army into Zulu territory. Chelmsford divided his army into three separate detachments, hoping to surround the Zulus and crush them into submission. The main army would be the centermost effort and be led by Chelmsford himself. Chelmsford's detachment was made up of two columns, the number two column and number three column. The third column made up the main effort of the advance and consisted of the 1st and 2nd Battalion of the 24th Regiment of Foot. Marching alongside the regulars was the Natal Native Contingent or Auxiliary Forces allied with the British. Comprising both infantry and cavalry, the Native Contingent were South African soldiers with various types of weapons from rifles to spears and shields and wore red bands around their heads to identify them from Zulu natives. These troops would fulfill mostly reconnaissance and supporting roles during the campaign. Additionally, the British would bring artillery with them, including a rocket battery for fire support. These weapons would fire explosive ordnance and devastate the enemy ranks if used appropriately. In addition to servants, handlers, and caretakers, the British force made up around 8,000 strong marching against the Zulus. With this force, the British believed the natives stood no chance. But what they failed to realize is that they would soon come head to head with one of the most disciplined and well-trained armies in all of Africa. The Zulus were anything but a loose mob of native tribesmen. Revolutionized by the King Shaka in the early 19th century, the Zulus had grown from a small clan to a warrior nation with a standing army organized into regiments and divisions. With this army, they were able to dominate their foes for many years and absorb more tribes into their ranks. This they were able to do with their famous attack formation known as Impando Zancomo, or the Beast's Horns. As simple as it was, the beast's horns could be difficult to execute if uncoordinated, but through extensive drilling, the Zulus were able to master it. The formation would be laid out with the center being the head, the flanks being the horns, and the reserve being the loins. The Zulus would attempt a double envelopment against their opponents by fixing the enemy in the center with the head while the horns attack the enemy's flanks and rear surrounding the enemy and destroying them. The Zulu king, Cheswayo, intended to use this tactic against the British and punish them for intruding on his lands. He intended on wasting no time. Known for their ability to run great distances, the Zulu army moved quickly to catch the British off guard and destroy them. Despite multiple battalions entering Zulu land at once, Cheswayo would confront the British main effort, which was Lord Chelmsford's army. Chelmsford's army would march in January of 1879 towards the Zulu capital of Alundi, but make slow progress due to the harsh terrain and swollen rivers. Before officially crossing into Zululand, Chelmsford would leave a company of soldiers at a mission station along the border known as Rourke's Drift. 
Rourke's Drift would be turned into a hospital and supply depot to support the invasion. After crossing the border, the slow-moving column would march about 10 miles into Zululand to a place called Isan Lawana, a large hill overlooking the countryside. Chelmsford decided to encamp here and begin scouting the area for an avenue of advance and for the Zulu army itself. Chelmsford moved his army to the east side of the hill and set up camp, but assumed he would not be there long and set up no defensive fortifications or even a defensive wagon circle. He did, however, send out scouting parties to recon the local area. One of these scouting parties found something alarming. A small force of Zulu warriors was discovered east of the camp and a light skirmish broke out. The scouting party was able to break contact and send word back to Chelmsford of what was found. Upon hearing this, Chelmsford and his staff reached the conclusion that the force that was discovered was the possible vanguard of a much larger Zulu army and that further investigation was in order and would be led by Chelmsford himself. Thinking that a fight might ensue, Chelmsford brought with him half of his entire army, leaving the camp where it was and traveling east. Left in command of the camp was Lieutenant Colonel Pauline, who was little more than an administrator and not as savvy with commanding battle formations as Chelmsford was. Defending the camp now was a handful of rifle companies, half of the native contingent, and the two seven-pound guns as the scouting force went east to search for the possible Zulu army. Reports had been coming into the main camp that Zulus were being spotted to the northeast. Boleyn attempted to reach out to Chelmsford of these reports, but received no response. Luckily, a contingent of troops arrived from Rourke's Drift, led by Colonel Anthony Dunford, who brought with him the rest of the native contingent and the rocket battery. Fearing that the pockets of Zulu forces in the northeast would attempt to attack Chelmsford's rear, reconnaissance of the northern hills was ordered, and the mounted native contingent, along with the rocket battery, would carry out the task. The small scouting party would reach the hills in the early afternoon, and what they would find was shocking. The entire Zulu army, roughly 20,000 warriors, had been discovered hiding within the northern hills. Outsmarting and outmaneuvering the British, Chess Wyo had intended to trick Chelmsford into believing that his force would attack from the east in order to divide his army. The ruse worked almost perfectly, leaving the camp vulnerable and lightly defended. Having now been discovered, the Zulu army wasted no time in committing to the upcoming fight. The army quickly organized and charged. Seeing the mass of Zulus attacking straight towards them, the scouting party quickly attempted to break contact by conducting a fighting withdrawal. Led by Dernford himself, the mounted contingent would dismount, fire at the approaching Zulus, remount, displace, and repeat in an attempt to keep the Zulus pinned down and advancing slowly. Meanwhile, a messenger was able to deliver a message to Pulane, saying that the Zulu army was en route. Pulane would also receive another message from Chelmsford, ordering him to break camp and join him in the east. With the latter now being near impossible, he instead ordered his forces to stand too, and ordered a company of soldiers along with the native contingent to screen north towards the expected advance. As the Zulus maneuvered towards the camp, they would assume the Beast's Horns formation, with the head charging towards the northern part of the camp, the right horn maneuvering around the hill, and the left horn attacking south towards the withdrawing cavalry. As the British regulars moved into position, morale was high, and for good reason. 
the veterans of the 24th Regiment of Foot were as well trained and disciplined as what was expected of a modern fighting force, and they had a formidable weapon at the ready. The Martini Henry rifle was a breech-loading rifle with a rate of fire of 12 rounds a minute, and fired a powerful 577 450 cartridge at an effective range of 800 yards. Despite its intensive kick, a British soldier would have been able to shoot with remarkable accuracy and at a high volume of fire at the advancing Zulus. This impressive volume of fire compared to muzzle loaders from 10 years prior allowed the soldiers to be more spread out than usual but still deliver a destructive volley. What is typically believed is that the British soldiers formed in double line formations with men shoulder to shoulder firing over the heads of the men in front of them. How the men at Isan Lawana actually formed was known as extended order or a single line of men separated by four paces. To cover a larger front, the 24th would actually double the extension to eight paces, or just over three yards. The Zulus maneuvered in long skirmish lines towards the British, and would only start to mass as they got closer to the camp. They did have a various assortment of rifles available to them, but their primary armament of choice was a short spear and cowhide shield combination that they used with great skill in close combat. In a hand-to-hand -hand fight against the British regulars, the Zulu warrior had the advantage. As both armies readied for combat, Durnford continued his fighting withdrawal south. Within minutes, the rocket battery was overrun and destroyed by the advancing Zulus. Meanwhile, the Zulu head came within range of the screening British and native force. The commander would give the order to open fire. Shortly after, the head of the Zulu formation came within range of the firing batteries, who began firing their salvos. As initial contact was made, it became clear to Pulane that the Zulu force directly north was their main effort. He pulled back the screening forces from the northwest and deployed his army in a long single file line that stretched out across the north of the camp. With hundreds of rifles now posturing towards the Zulus, the army seemed ready to fend off anything thrown at them. But there was a problem. Having little faith in surviving the day, the Natal native contingent placed in reserve began withdrawing from the field leaving the British regulars to defend the camp themselves. The Zulus advanced towards the British aggressively, but not recklessly. Their formations bound forward from one another and used cover when able to avoid enemy fire. At times, they would return fire themselves. Their chain of command stood to the rear of the advancing warriors, coordinating movements, monitoring the battlefield, and sending messages to change tactics if necessary. As the battle raged on to the north of the camp, Durnford and his men came within sight of Polain and the main army. Reinforcing the British right flank, his men would attempt to repel the enemy from a riverbed, but despite its strong position, they were running out of ammo and under threat from being surrounded. In the east, Chelmsford received word that the camp was under attack and made preparations to return to Isan Lawana, although it would take hours for him to get there. He didn't know how harsh the battle was at the time, but he must have been confident his men would repel the assault. He could not have possibly known how desperate the situation actually was.
backed up nearly to the southern border of the camp, Durnford and his cavalry were short on ammo and nearly surrounded. To shorten the perimeter, the British infantry began tightening their ranks closer to the camp by conducting fighting withdrawals at the company level. While this maneuver would be successful for a small amount of time, it would be too little, too late. Durnford's front was overrun, and the Zulu ranks began outflanking the British formations. Additionally, the Zulu right horn running around the mountain had exploited the southern gap in the British lines. Zulu army swarming their position, the British lines would hold no longer. Fighting was now hand to hand, face to face and short on ammo, bayonets, fists and rifle butts were now the only way the British could repel the army. But against the thousands of Zulu spears descending upon them, the situation was hopeless. In the camp itself, the few who remained amongst the tents became its last defenders. The remaining British and native troops would fight to the last man, one of which was the infamous charge of C Company. But as the smoke cleared, none of the contingent, including Polain and Durnford, would be left alive. The few who were able to escape the massacre did so via the south, and would flee the scene in a non-organized and desperate flight. Running for their lives, those who did survive were known as the Fugitives and would escape along a route now known as Fugitives Drift. Later that evening, Chelmsford and his force made it back to Isan Luana and walked the grounds of where the hundreds of British and African dead lay where they fell. The camp, the road, and the open fields were littered with the gruesome remnants of those who met their demise that day, and a feeling of shock and horror came over Chelmsford and his army. But it was not over. Miles away from the battlefield, fires could be seen lighting the evening sky from Rourke's Drift, the site of where a British garrison was left. It was believed that by now these men had received the same fate as the ones at Isan Luana. But surprisingly, the men of B Company were still fighting for their lives. Earlier, after hearing the savagery that took place at Isan Luana, these men fortified and strengthened their position. Soon after, 4,000 Zulu warriors from the loins of Cheswayo's army would defy orders, cross the river into Natal, and attack the garrison. What would follow was the infamous Battle of Warwick's Drift, where the 150 men of the 2nd Warwickshire would make their stand. Kill kill, facing a waiting... ah! 